materials scientists generally seem to believe that the property of a material is a function of its microstructure. What we mean by microstructure? For a polycrystalline material, we know that it is made up of a large number of grains. Each grain, in fact, is nothing but a single crystal. So, when it comes to microstructure, it conveys the idea of how the grains are arranged in the material, how big or how small they are, what is the average grain size, what is there inside the grains and what is there at the grain boundaries. One aspect which we seem to overlook is the orientation of the individual grains. As I have already said, each grain is nothing but a single crystal and therefore, how the single crystal is arranged in space is quite important. Say for example, the normal idea is that every material isotropic that means, same property in all possible directions. Now, in this particular figure, we denote the orientation by a particular color. A particular orientation is denoted by a particular color. So, there are about 11 grains over here and each color has got each grain has got a different color indicating that the orientations of no two grains are the same. In other words, the orientations of the grains are completely random. That means, if say in grain number 1, the 1 0 0 direction points in this direction, in grain number 3, it may be pointing in this direction, in grain number 4, it may be pointing in this direction, in grain number 5, in a different direction, in grain number 7, in yet a different direction, etcetera, etcetera. In such a case, when the grains are arranged in a completely random fashion, we say that the material is a random material and hence its behavior will be isotropic. That means, same property in all directions. That means, if we take a tensile sample, you know, parallel to this edge and if we take a tensile sample parallel to this edge or if we take a tensile sample making 45 degree to this edge and this edge, in all cases the tensile property should be the same. But in practice, this is never so. In fact, it has been found that under the sun, it is impossible to find a material which is completely random. In fact, some orientations are preferred by many of the grains. Now, this phenomenon is known as texture. Say for example, this is the microstructure of a regular material that we come across in this world. You see that here again a particular grain orientation is denoted by a particular color. Say for example, this blue denotes a particular orientation of the grains and you can see that not one, but many of the grains have got this blue orientation. That means, many of the grains have got this particular orientation. Again, the heavy green color, this green color is denotes a particular orientation and you can see that many of the grains have got this particular orientation. Again, if you look at the red color, quite a few of them have got this kind of an orientation. So, this microstructure shows that out of all the grains present in the material, quite a few have a 
you know similar orientation again some have another similar orientation a third group of grains have another similar group of orientations that means some orientations are preferred by the grains so this material is a textured material and this is the normal case most or almost all the materials in this world are textured some are lightly textured some are heavily textured now when we talk about orientation of grains it is necessary to define what is meant by orientation for this lecture i will concentrate only on sheet materials so whenever i talk of orientations etc i talk of orientations of grains in a sheet say for example we have a rolled sheet as shown here and this is the rolling direction now say we consider the grain over here now we have drawn the unit cell for that grain in an enlarged manner so this is the unit cell of the grain and what we find that this top plane of the unit cell which is nothing but the 001 plane is parallel to the rolling plane is parallel to the rolling plane not only that this particular direction of the unit cell which is nothing but the 100 direction is parallel to the rolling direction so this is a grain in which the 001 plane is parallel to the rolling plane and 100 direction is parallel to the rolling direction we say that this particular grain here has the orientation given by 001 within first bracket 100 within third bracket so this is the way we describe the orientation of a grain similarly over here we find this is a particular grain for which the 001 plane is parallel to the rolling plane and 110 direction is parallel to the rolling direction so the orientation of the grain is 001 110 similarly this grain has the orientation 110001 this grain has the orientation 111110 etc so this is the normal way we denote orientation of a grain we call it the hkl uvw notation that means the hkl plane is parallel to the rolling plane and the uvw direction is parallel to the rolling direction it is quite essential as we will find later on to have some idea of what is known as a stereographic projection in order to understand the way texture data is represented now the topic of stereographic projection has been discussed in depth earlier I will just give some few important aspects of stereographic projection for the purpose of this lecture say for example we are dealing with a cubic material the simplest material and this is the uh, a, a small very small cubic crystal it is so very small that we can consider it as a single point so we call it a point crystal or we can also call it a point unit cell of the cubic material now now keeping this point unit cell or point crystal at the center we construct a very big sphere we call it the reference sphere now the next step is we draw perpendiculars to the six faces of the point unit cell or the point crystal and as you can see over here half 
of the reference sphere will be on top of this plane and the other half will be at the back. Now, if we draw perpendiculars to the six faces, the perpendicular to the 1 0 0 will be cutting the reference sphere over here. Again bar 1 0 0 will cut the reference sphere at the back, then this will where the perpendicular to 0 1 0 will cut the reference sphere, this is where the perpendicular to 0 bar 1 0 will cut the reference sphere, this is where the perpendicular to 0 0 1 plane will cut the reference sphere and this is where the perpendicular to the 0 0 bar 1 plane will cut the reference sphere. Now, these points are known as the poles of the respective planes. The next step is we take a point of projection and put a source of light over there and we put a piece of paper parallel to the 0 0 1 plane of the point crystal or point unit cell. We allow the source of light, the rays of light to pass through all the poles on the reference sphere and these are allowed to fall on this piece of paper. Now, as you can see here, if we do that, we will get the 1 0 0 pole to be projected here, the bar 1 0 0 pole to be projected here, the 0 1 0 pole to be projected here and the 0 bar 1 0 pole to be projected here and here will be the 0 0 1 or 0 0 bar 1. So, this plane is a plane of projection parallel to the 0 0 1 plane in the point unit cell or the point crystal and this circle is known as the basic circle, it is the projection of the upper half of this sphere of the reference sphere as shown. So, what has happened here is we now have a drawing shown over here and we can see that in this drawing or in this projection all the planes you know they are present in the form of projections of their poles. For example, this is the projection of the pole of 1 0 0, this is the projection of the pole of 0 1 0. Now, in the actual crystal, if you see the angle between the 1 0 0 plane and the 0 1 0 plane, it is 90 degrees and in effect in the projection also this angle is 90 degrees. So, we see that all the angular relationships between the atomic planes in the point crystal or point unit cell can be found out from the locations of their projected poles. So, this kind of a projection is known as a stereographic projection. The name stereographic means angle through projection. So, this is an angle through projection as we can we have already found out. Now, this kind of a stereographic projection uh, is very important to know because we will see readily that texture data is very often represented in the form of some special type of stereographic projection called the pole figures. In the previous diagram, I showed the poles of only 1 0 0 type planes. For example, this pole is 0 0 1, this pole is 0 1 0, this is 0 bar 1 0, this is bar 1 0 0 and this is 1 0 0. Now, in the same diagram, in the same stereographic projection, we can also plot the poles of other planes. Say for example, 1 1 0 type planes and you know in this projection the 1 1 0 type poles have been plotted. So, this is the 1 1 0, this is bar 1 1 0, this is bar 1 bar 1 0, this is 1 bar 1 0, 1 0 1 0 1 1 bar 1 0 1 
0 bar 1 1 etcetera. And in the same projection we have also plotted the poles of the 1 1 1 type of planes like this is bar 1 bar 1 1 bar 1 1 1 1 1 1 1 bar 1 1. How to draw all these poles have been uh, has been explained in detail in the chapter on stereographic projection. Now, this particular projection as you already know is called a standard stereographic projection. And what kind of a standard stereographic projection? It is a 001 standard stereographic projection. Why 001? Because you have to remember that the projection plane is parallel to the 001 plane of the unit cell or the unit crystal. So, this is nothing but a 001 standard stereographic projection of a cubic unit cell or cubic single crystal. Now, we will discuss how to represent texture data. In fact, I will talk about the measurement of texture later. First, I would like to talk about the different methods of representing texture of a material. Now, there are three different methods, the pole figure method, the inverse pole figure method and the ODF or orientation distribution function method. The most common method of representing texture is the pole figure method. So, what is done in the pole figure method? Say we have this sheet material, we want to find out the texture of this sheet material. Now, any sheet material has got three mutually perpendicular parameters. For example, the rolling direction, the transverse direction and the normal direction. As in case of the construction of a stereographic projection, we take a small part of the sheet and put it over here such that the RD points in this direction, TD in this direction and ND the normal direction along this. Let us consider just one of the grains in this sheet material, just one and say we want to find out where the 1 0 0 type poles of that grain lie. So, what we do? We draw the 1 0 0 direction, the 0 1 0 direction and 0 0 1 direction in that particular grain over here. You know that in a cubic material 1 0 0 direction is perpendicular to the 1 0 0 plane, 0 1 0 direction is perpendicular to the 0 1 0 plane and 0 0 1 direction is perpendicular to the 0 0 1 plane. So, we allow those directions to emanate from the center. Again, this sheet is considered a point sheet so to say and we allow those directions to be extended so that they can uh, intersect with the surface of this big reference sphere. Once we do that, we find out the projections of those three poles. So, first what we do? We consider a very small sheet material from which the texture has to be determined and consider it to be very, very small indeed. Take one grain and within that grain we choose the 1 0 0, 0 1 0 and 0 0 1 directions say and allow those directions to be extended and intersect with the reference big reference sphere over here. Then in a manner similar to drawing of a stereographic projection, we find out the projection of the poles lying on the reference sphere. Now, once we do that, say for that particular grain, this particular point is the projection of the 0, 0, 1 pole. This particular point 
is a projection of the 1 0 0 pole, this particular point is a projection of the 0 1 0 pole in that particular grain. Now, suppose if so happens that by plotting the 1 0 0 0 1 0 and 0 0 1 poles from all the other grains, we find that all the 1 0 0 poles from the different grains are clustered together as shown here. All the uh, 1 0 0 poles are clustered together over here and all the 0 1 0 poles are clustered together over there. Then we realize that the orientation of the grains cannot be perfectly random. There is some preferred orientation or texture present. If it were a completely random material, in that case what we would have seen all these poles 1 0 0 0 1 0 0 0 1 all these poles would have been uniformly distributed over this projection plane. Now, so this is a stereographic projection of the 1 0 0 type of poles from the grains in a sheet material. Not only that, in this stereographic projection the specimen parameters are also present. So, this kind of a stereographic projection on which the specimen parameters are also superimposed is known as a pole figure. So, a pole figure shows the distribution of the poles of a particular type of planes on which the specimen parameters are also superimposed. Now, as I said already, this is the pole figure obtained from say a random material where all the poles are arranged in a random fashion. Now, how do we describe the density of the poles here? The way we do it is in this manner. Say for example, we find out a small area, we mark a small area in the pole figure of a random material and exactly at the same location of the pole figure from the experimental material, we mark the same area. Find out the number of poles within that area, find out the number of poles in this area, then divide the number of poles within this area in the experimental material by the number of poles in the corresponding area for the random material. In this case, there are 10 poles within this region and exactly in a similar region for the random materials is 1. So, we write 10 on this contour line indicating that this is a contour line whose intensity is 10 times of the random material. Similarly, we can have a contour here containing other poles and a corresponding contour here and again in the similar method we can find out that this contour is 5 times random, then this particular contour is 2 times random. So, we do not mention the random over here, we simply write 10, 5 and 2 indicating that these are 10 times, 5 times and 2 times random. Similarly, we can show the density of poles by contour lines over here and over here. So, we have now represented the poles of a particular type of planes in a number of grains of the sheet material in the form of a pole figure. Not only that, we have also determined the density of the poles with respect to the density of poles in a random material. So, as I said, this is our pole figure. You see, having a pole figure is not enough. Now, we will have to read this pole figure in order to find out what kind of texture the material has. So, this part I am coming to later on. Now, let us talk about the second type 
or the second method of representation of texture. It is called the inverse pole figure method. It is called the inverse pole figure method. If we go back a little bit, if you remember the standard 001 stereographic projection, you see all these lines as shown here have divided the entire circle into 24 equal triangles, so to say. Say for example, here 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So, 11, 12. So, there are above this line there are 12 triangles, below this line another 12. So, there are 24 triangles. Now, these 24 triangles have got something in common. For example, say you take this particular triangle, one of the corners is 0, 0, 1, another corner is bar 1, 0, 1, another corner is bar 1, 1, 1. That means, all these 24 triangles are uniform in the sense that one of the corners gives you a 1, 0, 0 type of pole, second corner gives you a 1, 1, 0 type pole, a third corner gives you a 1, 1, 1 type of pole. So, they are equivalent, so to say. All of them have got the same characteristic. Take this particular triangle, you know, here you will find this is a 1, 0, 0 type pole, this is a 1, 1, 1 type pole, this is a 1, 1, 0 type pole. So, any texture data uh, we can represent uh, in one of the unit triangles, so to say. So, that is the idea behind. Uh, the inverse pole figure method. So, in the inverse pole figure method, we choose a particular triangle here. This is as we have seen, this is a 0, 0, 1, this is 1, 1, 0 and this is the 1, 1, 1. So, this is the unit triangle. Now, what we do here in the inverse pole figure method, we plot the frequency of a particular direction of the sample within this space. Say for example, we talk about a sheet material, we talk about one grain and say the normal direction. What is the normal direction? We plot the location of the normal direction by a point over here. Similarly, in a sheet material, you have got the rolling direction. Say the rolling direction is plotted as a point over here in another unit triangle and then comes the transverse direction, then the transverse direction is plotted as a point over here. So, for that particular type, for that particular grain, you know we can have an idea of its orientation by plotting the normal direction, rolling direction and the transverse direction in three unit triangles in this manner. Now, when we have a large, when you consider a large number of grains in the sheet material and if we find all the normal directions are clustered together over here, all the rolling directions are clustered together over here, all the transverse direction plots are clustered together over here, we can see that the material is a textured material. If on the other hand, when you consider a large number of grains in the sheet material and if we find that the normal directions distributed all over the rolling direction is distributed all over, the transverse direction distributed all over that shows that is a random material. Now, example of a real inverse pole figure is given here. So, this is the normal direction inverse pole figure of an austenitic steel. So, here the this is the normal direction has been plotted and these are all the contour lines uh, with respect to the random material. So, you can see that how the normal directions of the different grains are arranged. You can see that here the intensity is 2.1 times random. That means, for most of the grains the normal directions have orientations close to 1, 1, 0 and quite substantial number of grains are such that their normal directions are close to the 1, 0, 0 because you see here the uh, you know is 1.8 times random. But what about the 1, 1, 1? Very little. That means, practically in this material the normal direction 
for none of the grains so to say is close to 1 1 1. So, in this way we find out we represent texture by using what is known as an inverse pole figure. Now, we come to the third method of representing a pole figure. It is called the orientation distribution function or ODF method. Now, in this method the way we represent texture or the way we represent an orientation is completely different from what we have known up till now. Say for example, if we take a sheet material specimen, then the sheet material specimen has three sample parameters. One is the rolling direction, the other is the transverse direction and the third one is the normal direction and all these three directions are mutually perpendicular to one another. Now, these three constitute what is known as a specimen frame. So, these three constitute what is known as the specimen frame and this is the same for all the grains within the specimen. Now, let us take just one of the grains of our sheet specimen. Now, if we look at the three directions 1 0 0, 0 1 0 and 0 0 1 in one of the grains, we know that they are mutually perpendicular to one another. So, this set is known as the crystallographic frame for grain number 1. For another grain, it may be a different set. For a third grain, it may be still different set. So, we have for each grain a crystallographic frame consisting of the three mutually perpendicular directions 1 0 0 0 1 0 0 0 1 we have well we have assumed cubic material here and for all the grains within the sheet material the specimen frame is the same consisting of the R D T D and N D directions. Here we define orientation by finding out what should be the angular rotation given to this crystallographic frame of a grain in such a manner that 1 0 0 becomes the same as R d, 0 1 0 becomes the same as T d and 0 0 1 becomes the same as N d. In fact, mathematically it can be shown that at least three rotations are needed to coincide the specimen frame with the crystallographic frame. Now, so, how we define the orientation of a grain in this particular case? So, this is say grain number 1 in our specimen. This is the specimen frame which is fixed for all the grains within the specimen and within the grain number 1, this is the crystallographic frame. So, what we do now? We try to coincide this particular crystallographic frame with the specimen frame in such a manner that 1 0 0 becomes the same as R d, 0 1 0 becomes the same as T d and 0 0 1 becomes the same as N d. Now, as I have already said at least three rotations will be needed to coincide this frame with the other one. Now, several uh, uh, systems of rotation have been suggested but we mostly use the one which has been given by Professor Bunge. Now, let us see what we do by the Bunge method. So, what we have done here, this is our specimen frame R d, T d, N d. This is our crystallographic frame 1 0 0, 0 1 0, 0 0 1. So, we have taken the crystallographic frame here and without doing any rotation put it on top of the specimen frame by coinciding the centers. So, without any rotational movement we take the specimen frame we take the specimen uh, the crystallographic frame from here and put it on top of the specimen frame over there. Now, Bunge suggested three consecutive rotations of the crystallographic frame in such a manner 
that ND and 001 coincide, RD and 100 coincide, TD and 010 coincide. Now, let us see what kind of method he has suggested. Well, uh, Bunge suggested three consecutive rotations around the specimen frame, around the specimen frame to make it coincident with the crystallographic frame. So, the first rotation he suggested is by an angle phi 1 around N D. So, the first rotation he has suggested is by an angle phi 1 around N D. So, how much is phi 1? You see the moment we give a rotation around N D, R D no longer stays in its original position. R D shifts to the position R D prime, T D shifts to the position T D prime. So, Bunge suggested the amount of the rotation phi 1 should be such that the new position of R d which is R d prime becomes perpendicular to the plane contained by 0 0 1 and N d. So, he suggested that the first rotation we give around N d by an angle phi 1 such that the new position of R d which is R d prime becomes perpendicular to the plane contained by 0 0 1 and N d. Okay. So, once this is done, so this is what happens here. So, this is R d prime, this is T d prime, this is the position of R d prime here T d prime. Now, the second rotation he has suggested is around R d prime by an amount phi. So, he has suggested a second rotation by an angle phi around R d prime. So, how much is phi? Phi is such that N d and 0 0 1 they become coincident. You see by the first rotation already we have seen that R d prime becomes perpendicular to the plane contained by N d and 0 0 1. So, he gives a second rotation around R d prime such that N d and 0 0 1 they become coincident and this will be apparent in the next diagram. So, you see that after the second rotation you know 0 0 1 and N d have become coincident. This is R d prime T d has traveled to a different position called T d double prime. Now, Bunge suggested a third rotation and how much is that? He has suggested a rotation by an angle phi 2 around the common N d and 0 0 1 direction. That means, now the rotation is about the common N d and 0 0 1 direction by an amount phi 2. How much is phi 2? Well, it is such that R d prime becomes coincident with 1 0 0, T d double prime become coincident with 0 1 0. So, this is the scheme of rotation which was suggested by Bunge. There have been other people also who suggested other types of rotations, but most of the crystallographers throughout the world they follow Bunge's method. So, if we now talk about the orientation of grain number 1 as I told you before, this is the crystallographic frame of grain number 1, this is, the, this is our grain number 1, this is the crystallographic frame of grain number 1. So, we wanted to make this crystallographic frame coincident with the specimen frame and according to Bunge we find that we have to have a series of three rotations phi 1 phi phi 2. So, the values of phi 1 phi phi 2 they denote the orientation of this grain number 1. Similarly, for a second grain within this specimen it has got a different um, crystallographic frame and again we find out what is the corresponding phi 1 phi phi 2 values in order to make the two frames coincident. So, we see that instead of describing orientation of a grain by h k l u v w, we uh, define the orientation grain by specifying the three angular rotations to be given to the specimen frame in order that the crystallographic frame of a grain can coincide with it. So, if we now consider an imaginary space, we call it the orientation space. Say this is a three dimensional orientation space and say this is the origin, 
this is phi 1, this is phi and this is phi 2. So, phi 1, phi, phi 2 they denote a 3 dimensional orientation space. In this space if say the phi 1 any point within this orientation space will denote the orientation of a grain because any point here will have the coordinates phi 1, phi, phi 2. Any point here another point will be a different set of phi 1, phi, phi 2. So, any point within these three dimensional space will denote orientation of a particular grain. Now, if we find by plotting the orientations of a large number of grains in the sample that all the points are clustered together within this space, we can say that the material must be a texture material. On the other hand, if all the phi 1, phi, phi 2 values for the different grains are distributed uniformly inside, then you can say that the material is a random material. Now, what is the size of this orientation space? You see for cubic materials, the orientation space is such that phi 1 varies from 0 to 90 degree, phi varies from 0 to 90 degree, phi 2 varies from 0 to 90 degree. Actually, the size of the orientation space depends on the symmetry elements possessed by the sample and also the material. Okay. For cubic material only, you know, we have got a, an orientation space which is cubic in nature and where phi 1, phi, phi 2 independently vary from 0 to 90 degree. Now, any information within a three dimensional object, you know, can be resolved by taking lot of sections of the three dimensional space. So, people you know prefer looking at the orientation distribution of grains within this three dimensional space by taking sections. The sections can be taken parallel to this side, sections can be taken parallel to this side or parallel to this side. So, for example, this particular the front section this is phi 2 is equal to 0 degree section. The back section here is phi 2 is equal to 90 degree section. Similarly, we can have phi 2 5 degree section, 10 degree section as we want. So, this is say the phi 2 85 degree, phi 2 10 degree, phi 2 45 degree sections. For steel engineers, the most important section of the orientation space is the phi 2 45 degree section. Why it is so important? Because if we take a steel and coal roll it very heavily, whatever the kind of steel we have, we will see that in general most of the uh, density, pole density will lie along this line in this section and also along this line in this section. And all orientations lying along this line is known to constitute what is known as the gamma fiber and all orientations lying along this line are known to constitute what is known as the alpha fiber. So, phi to 45 degree section is uh, very important for the steel engineers, but you know depending on the material, depending on the type of work we are doing, we can take um, phi 1 sections, phi sections whatever we want. Now, we come to the measurement of texture. When we talk about the measurement of texture, we distinguish between what is known as the macro texture or macroscopic texture and the micro texture or microscopic texture. Now, what is macro texture? In this particular method, we generally use x-ray diffraction to measure the texture and sometimes when the grain size is rather large, neutron diffraction is also used. Now, in this method, we scan a very wide, quite a wide area of the sample, so that the texture data is representative of the whole sheet material. So, it is on a macroscopic scale, a large number of the orientation is found out from a large number of grains and the texture is representative of the sheet material. Now, there is one thing which we must realize when we measure the macro texture. From the macro texture, it is impossible to find out what kind of orientation 
the grains, the individual grains are having. On the other hand, micro texture is carried out by electron backscatter diffraction or EBSD as we will see. And here a smaller area is generally scanned. That means you can have a small micro structure in the material and it is possible to find out the texture from that small microstructural region. So, you can get texture from a much narrower region. Not only that, it is also possible by this method to pinpoint what orientation the grains within that microscopic uh, region has. So, this is a big advantage compared to the other one because here you can look at the microstructure and you can also find out the orientations of individual grains which you cannot do in case of macro texture. As I said macro texture measurement is normally carried out by x-ray diffraction. Now, this is an x-ray diffraction unit uh, with what is known as a x-ray texture goniometer. So, here this is the x-ray source and you have got your specimen over here and you have got the x-ray counter to measure the diffracted radiation in this direction. Now, the specimen which is put in the texture goniometer is not stationary. In fact, when you have the x-ray beam falling on the specimen as is done you know for normal x-ray diffraction work, the x-rays are incident over a very small area of the sample. You see that small area may not cover many of the grains in the sample, but when we talk about texture, we need orientational aspects to be known from as many grains as possible within the material. But the x-ray beam that is incident, the beam dimension is very, very narrow. So, that may not cover many grains. So, that is the reason why while measuring texture by x-ray diffraction, the specimen we take is given some movement. For example, the specimen is allowed to translate. So, if you have the specimen, you allow the specimen to translate. So, this is the direction incident radiation, this is the direction of the diffracted radiation. So, the material is allowed to translate in its own plane. So, what happens once it translates? The area covered by the x-ray beam extends over a larger region to cover a larger number of grains. The specimen is given a second rotation also. For example, it is allowed to rotate in its own plane. So, you see that there are two rotations given to the specimen. So, this is your specimen x-ray beam is incident in this manner, diffracted beam is going out in this manner. The specimen is giving a translationary movement and at the same time the specimen is allowed to rotate in its own plane. That means, while it is doing the translationary movement, it also rotates around an axis perpendicular to the sheet. So, it is doing like this. So, it is making a translationary movement and at the same time it is also rotating in its own plane. So, you see that this specimen is given two kinds of movement, a translation movement and also a rotation movement like this. Now, once the entire, you see for texture measurement as I have already discussed, when we want to find out the orientational information from the grains, we just choose one particular type of planes. We are not, we do not consider a larger number of diffraction from a larger number of planes at the same time. So, we concentrate on the diffraction taking place from only one type of plane. This is very important. Say for example, a particular HKL plane is taken into consideration. So, depending on the work to be carried out, say we want to find out uh, the uh, orientational aspects from the 1, 1, 1 planes of as many grains as possible or depending on 
what kind of information we need, we may try to have information from the 200 planes from as many grains as possible etcetera, etcetera. So, what I mean to say is when you do the texture measurement, you know it is just like uh, uh, measurement, a normal measurement in x-ray diffraction, but we want information from only one type of planes. Say for example, we are interested to find out the texture by considering the orientational aspects of only the one, one type of planes from many grains. So, what we do? We put the specimen in the diffractometer in such a manner, if we know the specimen, what kind of specimen it is, you know, uh, we know what is the d value for the 1, 1, 1 planes. And once you know the d value for 1, 1, 1 type of planes, and if we know the wavelength of the monochromatic x radiation, so lambda is known, d is known, we can find out the value of theta from Bragg equation lambda is equal to 2d sin theta. So, for that particular type of diffraction only, the specimen is fixed in the diffractometer making the correct Bragg angle and this is the counter. So, this angle is 2 theta b angle between the incident direction and the diffraction direction. Now, once the direction of incident radiation and the direction of the diffracted radiation are fixed, no more change is allowed. So, we do not change anything else. The only thing is we give certain movement to the specimen. The idea is to make as many grains as possible to be irradiated by x-ray, so that we get information from as many grains of the spe specimen as possible. So, say we start the material in a horizontal position like this and you know x-ray beam is incident over here and it gets diffracted in this manner. The specimen starts giving the translational, we give the specimen the translational motion and at the same time it rotates in its own plane. Say it moves in this manner and completes the 360 degree rotation around its perpendicular. Once this is done, you know whenever this operation is going on, the intensity which may be diffracted, you know is all the time recorded by the counter. So, once it moves in its own plane by 360 degree, then the specimen, you know is rotated by say 5 degree around this axis. This is the axis I am talking about, this is the axis. So, the specimen is rotated by say 5 degrees in this manner why we do this kind of a movement? You see it may so happen that in its present position none of the grains have their 1, 1, 1 planes in a diffracting position, but you know those 1, 1, 1 planes may be slightly away from the diffracting position. So, if we give a movement like this, those 1, 1, 1 planes may come in a diffracting position. So, that is the reason why you know we move the specimen around this axis as shown over here by an alpha degree which is 5 degrees initially. So, it is moved by 5 degree and again it is given in that condition, it is given the to and fro motion and a rotational motion like this and it, we allow it to continue for 360 degree motion. Once this is done, then it is again moved by 5 degree around this axis and the same type of movement is given to the specimen. All the while the intensity diffracted you know along this direction is recorded by the counter. So, if we start the specimen from a horizontal position you know by this movement we come up to the vertical position or if we start from the vertical position we ultimately come to the horizontal position in intervals of 5 degrees so to say. And all the while the intensity that is diffracted by the specimen will be recorded by the counter. Now, the question is how we try to correlate the intensity that is obtained by the counter at different times with the grains which give rise to those diffracted radiations. So, how we do that? You see normally the 
diffracted radiation is plotted in the form of a diagram like this. You know, we have got a diagram like this. So, this is center and these circles are at say 5 degrees away. So, this is a 5 degrees circle, 5 degrees away, this is 10 degrees away, this is 15 degrees away, this is 20 degrees away up to about say 90 degrees. Now, this kind of a, a diagram is used to record the diffracted radiation. Now, how it is done I will explain to you in the next diagram. Say for example, we start our experiment in this manner, we take the specimen in a vertical position say this is our specimen and we take it in the vertical position and we fix the direction of the incident x radiation, we also fix the direction of the diffracted radiation. So, in this position this is the R d the rolling direction, this is the T d and this is the N d or normal direction. Now, here is what we have the k vector you know k with a bar on top this is the k vector. What is the k vector? k vector divides the angle between the incident direction and the diffracted direction. So, it divides it bisects the angle between the incident x radiation direction and the diffracted direction. So, this is the k vector. So, when the sample is uh, in its vertical position you know at the beginning of the experiment the k vector and n d they are in the same direction. Now, suppose the specimen you know is given its translationary motion and is rotational motion in its own plane and it is done after every 5 degrees. So, this is the first position then it comes to this 5 degrees 10 degrees and comes to this position. So, the second uh, position is this from here say it the, from the vertical position the specimen comes to the horizontal position. Now, when it happens what happens here? Now, when it comes to the horizontal position we find now R d which was in this direction R d comes in this direction. So, R d becomes the same as the k, k direction. So, you see that the k vector and R d become the same. So, this is the second position. Now, suppose this specimen is rotated in its own plane. So, if it is rotated in its own plane, so your R d is now pointing this way. So, if it is rotated 90 degree, then R d goes in this direction and T d and k vector they become the same. So, this is a position like this. So, now when it is rotated you know the in the horizontal position, if it is given a rotation of 90 degree in this direction, then R d comes over here and T d which was in this direction by 90 rotation it comes over here and k vector it now assumes the same direction as the k vector. You see the k vector never changes because the direction of incidence and the diffracted radiation they never change. So, the k vector does not change. So, you say that when you come from the vertical to the horizontal position k vector which was along n d in the vertical position now it comes to the R d position. That means, it start with you know if we take this uh, figure as a circle and if suppose this particular position you know if you have the vertical specimen the vertical position and we take a projection plane parallel to that. So, this is the projection plane parallel to the vertical position. So, in this condition the n d or k vector they are over here. So, k vector position is over here. Now, when the specimen changes from the vertical position to the horizontal position, what happens? k vector becomes the same as R d. So, the k vector effectively travels from N d to R d because you know, this is R d, this is N d, this is T d. So, in the vertical position k vector is here, in the horizontal position k vector is there. So, you say that when you know we change alpha you know as alpha changes the k vector 
changes from here to here. And when in the horizontal position, it changes by 90 degree, that means k vector, it is synonymous to Rd here. So, when it moves 90 degrees, the horizontal position, k vector becomes synonymous to Td. So, from Rd to Td, k vector starts from here and goes over there. So, you see that whenever a specimen is moving in its own plane and making to and fro uh, direction, then actually uh, the k vector travels from here to here. And when the specimen is giving different degrees, you know, change by say angle alpha like this around this axis, then k vector changes from here to here. So, knowing this, you can easily figure out where you can plot the diffraction data in this type of a diagram. And this diagram is nothing but, you know, a kind of stereographic projection of the 1, 1, 1 poles emanating from the specimen. So, when you are right in this position and you find the diffracted intensity has got certain value, so you plot the diffracted intensity over here. Then you go to change this to 5 degrees from here, it changes by 5 degrees and do the same kind of rotation and then you are in this kind of a circle 5 degrees away from the end and you measure whatever the diffracted radiation along this line. In a similar manner, when it is changed to 10 degrees, then you go to the 10 degrees circle and whatever diffracted radiation is obtained in the counter, you measure over, you plot over there. So, nowadays the movement of the specimen is synchronized with the plotting of the intensities in this kind of a figure. And once this is done, we get what is known as a pole figure over here. So, you see that this is the pole figure because here we have got the 1, 1 type pole densities and we have also got the specimen parameters marked on it Nd, Rd and Td. So, you see that by X-ray diffraction, what we do is we find out the density of the 1, 1, 1 type of poles from the specimen under different conditions of movement and rotation. And this is plotted in terms of a pole figure. Here, this is 1, 1, 1 pole densities and here the specimen frame represented by Rd, Nd and Td. So, this is essentially what is known as a pole figure which has been drawn by XID experiments. Now, getting a pole figure is the first part of the job. Now, we have to interpret the pole figure that from the pole figure, uh, what knowledge we have about the texture of the material. Say for example, I show here a 1, 1, 1 pole figure of nickel. That means, it is you know this nickel was heavily coal rolled um, 95 percent and then it was annealed so that the whole thing recrystallized. So, this is the pole figure of recrystallized nickel. This is the rolling direction, this is the transverse direction and this is the normal direction. So, all these different colors talk about the densities of the poles over here in terms of random. Now, this is the kind of experimental pole figure we obtain by measuring the 1, 1, 1 poles of nickel. Now, what kind of texture the material must possess? How do we know that? Now, please remember that this pole figure was drawn by taking the projection plane parallel to the original specimen position. So, if the original specimen position is like this, the projection plane is parallel to this. So, this pole figure has been taken on a projection plane which is parallel to the specimen surface. And what type of poles have been plotted? This is, these are the 1, 1, 1 type of poles which have been plotted. Now, how do we uh, uh, read this particular pole figure? Now, in order to read a pole figure, we have to have a large number of standard stereographic 
projections with us. Now, if you remember, we talked about a 001 standard stereographic projection. So, what we do? We take the 001 standard stereographic projection and superimpose on this pole figure. Once we do that, you see this is what the situation looks like. So, the blue colored diagram is the 001 standard stereographic projection and below this we have got the pole figure where the 1 1 1 poles have been plotted. Now, interestingly we find that all these high pole densities in the actual pole figure they coincide with 1 1 1 pole positions in the standard stereographic projection. But how is it possible? You see, we have drawn, we have got 1 1 1 pole densities. We have measured 1 1 1 pole densities and plotted them in the pole figure and their location is this. And when I superimpose the 0 0 1 standard stereographic projection, I find that all the 1 1 1 poles of the standard projection, they coincide with those 1 1 1 density pole densities. So, what does that mean? You see, when you, when you talk about the stereographic projection of the pole figure here, the, which is below the standard stereographic projection, the pole figure was drawn, again I must mention to you, the pole figure was parallel to the specimen surface and the standard 001 stereographic projection was taken by taking it the projection plane parallel to the 001 plane. So, it automatically suggests that if the 111 pole densities of the pole figure coincide with 111 locations in the standard stereographic projection, it automatically suggests that it is possible only when the projection plane of the stereographic standard stereographic projection is the same as the plane of the surface of the sample. That means, it is possible this kind of a uh, you know match is possible only when the specimen surface is parallel to 0 0 1. So, now we know that we have got a specimen you know from this uh, pole density pole figure, we have got a specimen whose surface must be parallel to 0 0 1. Otherwise, you know the 1 1 1 pole densities in the pole figure would not have matched with the 1 1 1 type of poles in the 0 0 1 standard stereographic projection. So, the standard stereographic projection here is one where the projection plane was parallel to the 0 0 1 plane and the pole figure here is one in which the plot has been made on a plane parallel to the surface of the sheet material. So, the surface of the sheet material must be 0 0 1. So, the first part of the problem we found out, figure out which plane of most of the grains is parallel to the sheet plane. So, it is 0 0 1 and which direction is parallel to the rolling direction as you can see here after superimposition this is the R d of the pole figure and this is the bar 1 0 0 of the standard stereographic projection. So, we can immediately say that this kind of pole distribution when you get in a pole figure that corresponds to a texture given by 0 0 1 bar 1 0 0. That means, H k L is 0 0 1 U v w is bar 1 0 0. So, in order to read a pole figure it is necessary to have quite a large number of standard stereographic projections that will help. Now, we come to macro texture measurement by ODF. You see what is done in case of ODF in the orientation distribution function. Here what we do is we describe the pole density within the three dimensional orientation space by a function of this type. This is called a spherical harmonic function. You see this is very similar to you know what we used to do in our first year physics. You know if we wanted uh, to find out the 
distribution of free electrons in an atom uh, by what is known as a Schrodinger function. It is very similar to that. Now, here you know there are three terms. One is a function of phi, another is a function of phi 2, a third one is a function of phi 1. So, these are all mathematical functions and these can easily be found out for different values of phi and phi 1 and phi 2 and tabulated. Now, in this part, these are the coefficients C L M N. These coefficients in fact are related to the pole densities in a pole figure. So, in a way whatever data we get uh, in order to draw the pole figure, that data is transferred in this particular type of spherical harmonic functions and we describe the pole density by a function of this type f phi 1 phi phi 2. Okay. So, if delta V g is the volume of all the crystal lights having orientation in the range from g to g plus delta g and if v is the volume of the whole sample, then the orientation distribution function is defined by this. So, this is the orientation distribution function delta V g by v we write it as f g d g. Okay. Now, this f g g's orientation can be represented as f phi 1 phi phi 2. Now, it is quite possible to find out what is the h k l u v w value for a particular value of f phi 1 phi phi 2. You know this can be found out because these are mathematically related. Now, this function is proportional to you know the pole density of the h k l planes in the pole figures. You know this is a fundamental relation of texture analysis, but you see the pole density is proportional to intensity of diffracted beam from the h k l planes. Therefore, you know this function is related to the intensity obtained by diffraction from the h k l planes. So, that is what I told you already that this function can be found out from the pole density data by treating that data in the form of a mathematical function. And then we can plot this function in the orientation space, three dimensional orientation space and we get the ODF or the orientation distribution function. Now, this shows you know the it is again the ODF of recrystallized nickel for which we have shown the pole figure previously. So, this is the ODF of the same sample of nickel and here we have taken a, you know a various sections of the uh, uh, ODF of the three dimensional orientation space. As you can see for each section this is the phi 1 direction, this is the phi direction. So, this is phi to 0 degree, this is phi to 5 degree uh, section, this is phi to 10 degree section, this is phi to 15 degree section etcetera etcetera, this is phi to 90 degree section. So, the entire pole density distribution within the three dimensional um, orientation space can be represented by finding out the uh, various sections of the three dimensional orientation space in this manner. Now, why people go for ODFs? You see whatever orientation data we plot in a pole figure, in a pole figure within such a small space you know you have to plot the pole density. Now, if suppose the texture is such that there are 4 or 5 different types of components, maybe H k L U V W some grains have orientation close to H k L U V W, some grains have orientations the H 1 K 1 L 1 U, U 1 V 1 W, some grains have orientations close to H 2 K 2 L 2 U V W U V U 2 V 2 W 2 etcetera etcetera. Then all those texture components they are smeared on a, in a circular pole figure. So, within a small space you have got lots and lots of poles and it may be very difficult to figure out you know what are the specific uh, texture orientations. But in case of an ODF you know we have a much bigger space in which to represent orientation. So, it has a much better resolution and that is the reason why people use the ODFs nowadays they prefer using ODFs over pole figures although most of the routine work is still carried out using pole figures. Now, 
since the data used by pole figures and ODFs are the same, we cannot say that one is more accurate than the other. No, the accuracy is the same in both cases. The only thing is the ODFs have a better resolution than the corresponding pole figures. Now we go to micro texture measurement by electron backscatter diffraction method. We use an equipment which is nowadays known as the orientation imaging microscopy. You see it is basically a scanning electron microscope with which a EBSD attachment, elect electron backscatter diffraction attachment is attached. You see what happens here, you have the electron beam in the scanning electron microscope and it falls on your specimen. This is your specimen and you can have both things one of the other. You can have the image and also you can have the EBSD pattern. So, it is just like what we get from a transmission electron microscope. We can have the image and we have the diffraction pattern. From the image, we get the microstructural aspects and from the diffraction pattern, we get the orientational aspects. In a similar way, you know, in an orientation imaging microscopy, we get not only the image, but at the same time, we get the orientational aspects from the electron backscatter diffraction pattern. Now, if you look at the electron backscatter diffraction pattern, they look very similar to the Kikuchi patterns which are obtained from rather thick specimens in a transmission electron microscope. And from the Kikuchi pattern, it is possible to accurately determine the orientation. So, in this particular method, we see that if this is the microstructure, this is the microstructure, you can see the grains over here and you can find out the EBSD patterns from each and every grain. So, you see that this is a method in which you not only get microstructure, but at the same time you also have an idea of the orientation aspects. So, this is in a way one step ahead of the macro texture which is measured by uh, extra diffraction because there we cannot pinpoint uh, which grain has got which orientation. The output from orientation imaging microscope is given in terms of what is known as an orientation map. You see these are all the grains, you know you can see the grains very, very clearly, but the grains are colored. You know each color gives a particular orientation. For example, look at the blue colored grains. So, what are the blue colored grains? These are 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 bar 2 type of grains. You know the 5, 1, 5, 2 value, 5, 2, 5, 1, 5, 5, 2 values are given over here. And you know not only that, the fraction of such grains in the entire microstructure is also given in this column. So, you say that with orientation imaging microscopy, when we do the micro texture measurement by EBSD method. So, you say that when we do the micro texture measurement by the EBSD method, we not only get the microstructure, at the same time we also get data regarding the orientational aspects. Not only that, we can pinpoint which grain has got what kind of orientation. So, this is a big advancement and that is why orientation imaging microscopy is becoming more and more popular these days. And nowadays, most of the people in different laboratories, academic institutions and industries, they measure texture with the help of orientation imaging microscopy. That means, with the same EBSD attachment. Uh, the only thing we have to be careful about when we measure texture in the orientation imaging microscopy, we should be careful to take a large number of grains, you know, uh, under purview. Otherwise, whatever texture we determine will not be representative of the sheet sample. Now, this is the 111 pole figure of an interstitial free steel which was measured by the EBSD method and this is uh, the ODF of the same steel again measured with the EBSD method. You see the orientation imaging microscopy uh, gives you lot more information too. For example, by the EBSD method 
we can have information about the grain boundary character distribution. So, what is the fraction of grain boundaries, which are the low angle boundaries, what are the high angle boundaries and the CSL boundaries, all this information can be obtained from this orientation imaging microscopy. It can also yield a lot of information about how the misorientation angle distribution takes place in a particular area amongst the different grains, as you can see here. Texture has many, many applications. You see, when we talk about deep drawing quality steels for automobiles, we find that steels which have the sheets having grains, which have their one, one, one planes parallel to the sheet plane, they will be better for deep drawing quality steel. So, there is a need for production of a sharp texture in the deep drawing quality steels for auto bodies. Then in superconductor substrates also, nowadays we find that you know the high temperature superconductor YBCO yttrium barium copper oxide. We know that yttrium barium copper oxide cannot be put into the form of a wad. You know, so what we do, we deposit yttrium barium copper oxide on a substrate of nickel tungsten alloy. Now, it has been found that if the substrate is textured, the texture is taken by the overlying YBCO. And if the nickel tungsten alloy has a sharp cube texture, cube texture means the most of the grains have the 1, 0, 0 planes parallel to the rolling plane and 0, 0, 1 directions parallel to the rolling direction, then that type of texture is taken up by the YBCO. And what is the effect? The effect is the critical current density improves by 10 to the power 5 to 10 to the power 6 times. So, you see how important texture is in coated superconductor substrates. Again, for aluminum beverage cans, you have to have the right kind of texture to avoid the earring propensity. Then and electrical transformer steels, we know that in coal rolled grain oriented steels are very much needed for electrical transformers in order to minimize the hysteresis loss. So, texture is very, very important over there. Then there are so many other applications of thin films, coatings, corrosion and many more. Now, I would finally, I would like to tell you, show you if three diagrams which shows how important texture is to the engineer. Say for example, when you talk about a deep drawing quality still, in a deep drawing quality still, um, we have to, when you deep draw a still, deep drawing means we take a sheet of still and cut out a portion and you know say for example, if we have to make the upper portion, the upper portion of a motor car, we have the die take the steel and press against the die very hard, so that the steel takes the shape of the die. So, in one go, you make the whole upper part of a motor car. Now, in order to do that, the steel must be highly deep drive, drivable. And what we mean by deep drivable? You know, if you take a sheet steel and if we want to draw it like that, we want that the sheet will spread in its own plane much more before the thickness gets reduced because then it will fail. Now, in order to do that, we must have a situation where the strain in the width direction of the steel divided by strain in the thickness direction should be the value should be as high as possible. Now, this ratio is known as R it is called the Langford parameter. It is a Langford parameter. So, in order that the steel can be deep drawn, it is essential that this value is much higher than this value. That will ensure that when you draw the steel, you know it will spread in its own plane much before the thickness reduces. So, that def, you know failure will occur. So, for any sheet steel which we use for making auto bodies, you know, where deep drawing is the process, this value should be as high as possible. And as you can see here, I have plotted all these values, the R values for differently textured 
material. So, this is 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0 textured material, this is for 1, 1, 2, 1, 1, 0 textured material, this is for 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0 textured material, this is 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 2 textured material, etcetera, etcetera. And this is the angle to the rolling direction of the sheet. So, you can see that R can vary, you know, very largely, you know, in the differently textured materials. So, you can see that how texture affects the R value. So, this is one of the examples I which, which I wanted to tell you how important texture is in industrial practice. Now, this is another diagram where I have plotted sigma theta by sigma 0. So, what I have done essentially is I have taken a sheet material, I have taken a sheet material, say this is the rolling direction, this is the transverse direction and of course, this is the normal direction. Now, if we take a tensile sample along the rolling direction, you know we consider that direction that value is written as sigma 0. Okay? Now, if we take a tensile sample, you know in the transverse direction, along the transverse direction, the value obtained of the tensile strength we write as sigma 90. So, if we take, if we take any other direction, say this direction makes making an angle, making an angle theta with the rolling direction, then we call it sigma theta. So, what we have done? We have divided sigma theta by sigma 0 and that value has been plotted against theta for differently textured materials as you can see over here and you can see how they vary you know uh, with theta and with different texture components. Finally, I will show you a case where we have plotted Young's modulus versus theta for differently textured material. You see Young's modulus is a structure insensitive property. That means, by changing the microstructure you cannot change Young's modulus, but Young's modulus is very much a function of the texture of the material and that's, that is amply shown by these diagrams. So, finally, I would like to say this much that texture is very much important just like microstructure and in our undergraduate days when we were young, we were told that property of a material is a function of its microstructure, but this is no longer so. Now, we know that property is a function of microstructure as well as texture and the importance of texture is growing day by day and therefore, this can no longer be ignored.